Stuart Black, INSEAD professor and co-author of a new book called Sunset in the Land of the Rising Sun. Uh, it's about Japanese uh, companies and how they haven't fared right. too well over the past uh, decade or so. Yeah. Now, you were, you were looking back to 1995 um, and we saw a, a reasonable number of companies, uh, Japanese companies in Fortune 500, but mm -hmm. since that time they're decreasing almost year by year. Why is that? Yeah, not just a reasonable number. They were number one. So they occupied actually the top three spots and in terms of market share of the Fortune Global 500, uh, Japan was number one with about a 36% share. US was number two at about uh, 30%. And since that time, the Japanese share of that group has declined to about 12%. So from 36% to 12%. It's a dramatic fall off. And then you've seen Europe picking up and so on to take yeah. up the slack. Europe picked up a little bit, but most of the slack that, uh, or share really, that Japan gave up got captured by uh, companies from emerging markets, Brazil, China, India, Russia, et cetera. Um, so the U.S. held its own over that 15-year period. Uh, Europe held its own, plus gained a little bit, and Japan lost dramatically. Um, and the answer really comes down to globalization. So Japan reached that pinnacle primarily through domestic success and exports, um, which are important, but that'll only take you so far before you have to literally expand overseas, set up shop, factories, et cetera. And that's where they stumbled because uh, they sent only Japanese expats by and large um, they took uh, their systems that worked in Japan and had worked extraordinarily well. I mean, when you think about it, uh, back around 1940, just before World War II, Japan was only the number seventh uh, economy in the world, rose to number two, now they're number three, and I'll predict they'll fall some more, um, because what led to great domestic and export success uh, standardization doesn't really help you when you expand into foreign and different markets. And that's where they've stumbled and continue to stumble. So in the 80s, everybody thought the Japanese way, that's the way to do it. And, right. And the economy was booming. Yep. But since then, stagnation. Yeah. Um, you know, and so the Japanese have two things working against them. Uh, so one is their inability to adjust and adapt to markets outside of Japan. Uh, and the second thing is the home market is uh, shrinking. And a good part of that is just demographics. So Japan population peaked, different uh, estimates, but about 2004. And it'll continue to decline out through 2030, 2050. And it'll go from 127 million down to predictions are around 90 million. So it's a dramatic decrease in population. So it's pretty hard to have a growing economy when you have a shrinking population. And they're not making up virtually any of that deficit with uh, immigration or anything else. So uh, the prospects for the you know, domestic Japan economy don't look good. So you, your basic premise is that Japan did expand overseas, that we, mm -hmm. we saw them open car plants in the um, UK, US but they were doing it uh, in the Japanese way. Mm -hmm. Rather than trying to globalize the company, uh, maybe diversify their executives, their, their top talent. Yeah, so we've done all sorts of analysis, but when you look at uh, the top senior executives, the top 50, 25 uh, sort of corporate officers, uh, in Japan, about 99% of them are Japanese. When you look at European companies, it's about 78% are home country nationals. And when you look at US companies, it's about 82%. So every multinational still tends to be dominated by uh, nationals from wherever that global corporate headquarters is located. But in comparison, Japanese multinationals uh, have virtually no foreigners as senior executives. So there's no opportunity for different viewpoints, experience, et cetera, be, to be introduced into their large, uh, you know, major decisions, uh, especially around global strategy, and that's that's hurt them. You've been teaching in Japan for several years. Um, yeah. 
What would your advice be? Is it to try to diversify as much as possible? Certainly diversify the leadership. So first of all, they have not been good at identifying and developing uh, local leaders. Um, so in most Japanese subsidiaries, not only is the MD a Japanese expatriate, but virtually all of his direct reports are, uh, which is astounding when you think about how long uh, you know, they've been operating in some of these countries. So Singapore is a great example. A uh, good number of Japanese multinationals have been uh, here in Singapore with operations for 20 or 30 years. And yet their MD as well as his direct reports are still all Japanese. It's pretty hard to make the case that there aren't qualified Singaporeans to take up those positions. And when you look at European and US firms in Singapore, then a much, much, much larger proportion of their local managers are local Singaporeans. So, you know, that's the first thing. But, you know, even if they did that well, it'd take another 20 years for those locals to rise to local positions, then regional positions, and then global positions. And I'm not sure that Japanese companies have another 30 years to wait. Um, so at the same time, they may be well advised to go out and really look for senior executive talent, uh, non-Japanese senior executive talent, and pull it in. Um, and uh, thus far, they haven't done it. The only two noteworthy cases are Nissan and Sony, and in both cases, it really got forced on them because of uh, you know, company financial crisis. You can't get new ideas without new and different people. Um, you know, people who grew up in the same educational system, culture, language, etc., you know, have similar thoughts and uh, you can't get new ideas unless you have people who grew up outside of that system. So whatever the system is, it's not that the Japanese system is bad and the German system is good, it's just that a system is just that, a system. Japanese corporates though are unlikely to uh, listen to this message. I, you know, I have my doubts, which is why the subtitle of the book is why Japanese multinationals you know, will continue to struggle in a global future. Um, so there's a lot of uh, momentum against this. But if they don't make changes, I'll predict that their market share and their standing will continue to decline because uh, Japanese market is going to decline. And therefore, what helped them in the past, domestic success, isn't there anymore. Uh, the population is shrinking, the market will shrink. We don't have any examples of economies where the population has shrunk and the GDP has dramatically increased. We don't have any examples of that. So if your home market is shrinking and you're not doing well in overseas markets that are growing, net-net, you're really going to shrink, especially relative to European and uh, you know, US firms that are expanding aggressively overseas. Plus, then you have the emerging market multinationals. But what are the lessons for them, the, uh, the companies like Hire and so on? I think there are you know, several key lessons. So one is uh, keep in mind that what helped you grow domestically and grow as an exporter are not those things that help you grow as you expand overseas and then integrate as a global corporation because what helps you uh, expand at home and exports is really standardization. And it's what keeps your costs low. And as your costs are low, it allows you to use price to gain access to overseas markets. But standardization is not what really helps you grow internationally because uh, people don't want exactly the same things all over the world. And you have to adjust your products. Plus, what helped you grow at home in terms of how you managed your people is not what's going to help you overseas because people in other countries don't uh, function the same way. They don't have the same management techniques. They don't respond to the same you know, motivators. So you have to change your management style as well. Um, so those are two big things that uh, you know, multinationals from these emerging markets have to keep in mind. And the third one is they have to be very conscious about ensuring they identify and develop leaders who are outside their home country. And uh, we've done a lot of research, and this is one of the things they're slow on. So if we look at some of the largest multinationals from emerging markets in Brazil, in India, in China, in Russia, 
their senior leadership is still dominated by what I would call home country nationals and they have very few foreigners uh, in their senior ranks. So that's probably the most important thing for them to watch out for and to work hard to ensure that they don't let that home country national bias continue much longer. Stuart Black, thanks a lot for joining us. Great, thanks for being here.